forgot about the media. Forgot about the media. So, last week actually I, I was talking about prayer and I mentioned something about how, how heart-wrenching it is when you're a parent and you can't give something that your child is asking you for. Either or can't or won't. You know it's not good for them, it's not right for them, or you can't afford it or something. I think one of the things I used was an example was like to give them a car, for instance. It might not be something that, that all of us could do. I heard a story this week about uh, a woman who, who decided she would give her, her both her children a car. And uh, so she was able to do that, but she, she, she had a few kind of riders on this, and one of them, besides the usual insurance, I guess probably uh, driver's ed and all that kind of thing, was <coughs> she brought a friend in who was a police officer, I think an OPP, to uh, uh, have a little one-on-one -on -one with them, okay, before they started driving. And one of the, the things that the police officer told these, these young folk was that, okay, if you're driving down the road and you get pulled over by an unmarked car, don't open your window or your door to the, that, that person. Call 911, see if it's for real. Or if you're, if you're driving along the road, and he said, this is especially for you young ladies, he says, you know, so, uh, and someone flags you down, they need your help desperately by the side of the road, he says, don't stop, call 911. <laughs> there's somebody back there in need, I guess. If you're driving along and there's, someone seems to have had an accident, they're over in the ditch or something like this, and you think, oh, somebody might be here, I better stop, don't stop, carry on, call 911. Ever heard anything like that before? Well, the reason is, apparently there's a lot of scams going on in our world today, where people will, will set up something like that to ambush people, especially young women. And then when you stop to go and help, uh, they can do horrible things. You know? Not just rob you, perhaps rape you. So it was a warning for these kids to, to be careful. So I thought, uh, there's a sermon that's just gonna fit right in with my Good Samaritan talk today. <laughs> but I'm not quite sure how. It's, it's kind of a, a don't be a good Samaritan kind of story. But it's actually more, you know, you got to be careful. Now, another thing that is true in our province and in most of the other provinces is that there is a thing called the Good Samaritan Act in play or in place. And uh, just about every, 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 all but one province and one territory, Canada and many other kind of Western countries, have a Good Samaritan Act or the like. And often they're called the Good Samaritan Act based on this Bible story. And it, it basically relieves people of liability. If you do stop to help someone, and maybe you don't do it as well as you should, you drag them out of a fire and they break their arm, or you, you move them when they shouldn't be moved without a special board, and they're paralyzed from the waist down or something, they can't sue you. Because if you did it in good faith, it, to the best of your ability, you're covered by the Good Samaritan Act. Isn't that great? There's a couple of stories there. Um, so what's it all about? I mean, to be a good Samaritan or not to be a good Samaritan? That is the question. So let's, let's go back to the original story and, and mine it for all it's worth because it's a marvelous story. It's one that's very well known, uh, preached on a, a quite a bit. Oh, if you remember a few years ago, <laughs> I don't know if you remember the, the time that they, uh, they put on the play, The Good Samaritan. It was, uh, it was uh, our son Dave, and Mark Johnson, and Bradford Burke, and I don't know who else, a couple others. Steve, oh yeah, Steve was in it, Steve Morgan. And, uh, so in, they, they wrote the play themselves. Based on this, they took months to write the play. <laughs> I was there, I know, painful. <laughs> and, uh, it, but it was funny, as any, I'll get in, they, they just did a great job. So I went, now you have a movie of that somewhere, right? I think. Somewhere, you should find that, I'd like to see that again. Uh, you know, so, so for instance, the guys that ambushed the guy on the road are hillbillies. And you know they got teeth blacked out and you know hillbilly stuff on, and they've got a sign up that says "Toll Booth," and it's like T O L E B, you know B U T H or something like that. Toll Booth, and, and, and the guy stops for the toll booth. They you know they they rob him, beat him, and stuff. But that's another story. Okay, <laughs> what a wonderful story. <laughs> so. But, but the, there's a background to it here, and it starts right at the beginning in verse 25. It says, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. An expert in the law. Uh, so that, that's what this version says. Some of them say scribe. The old versions say scribe, and uh, some of the versions say, who do you think an expert in the law is? A lawyer, right? So a lawyer. But they're basically an expert in 
Moses law or the, the you know the biblical law the Old Testament um, which reminded me of the song that the kids sang at the vibe at the end of the week they, they had the they had this song so so the scribes and the Pharisees they were kind of the same ilk they they were experts in the law and the, the kids had a song it's, it's kind of uh, I just want to be a sheep bad 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 like this and then I don't want to be a sad you see because they're so sad you see yeah right sad, sad you see <laughs> And I don't want to be a Pharisee because they're not, they're not fair, you see. They're not fair. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, so that's a problem. You can be an expert in the law and not actually be a very just person or a fair person on the inside, which is kind of the story we're going to get into here. Well, he has a great question. And it's a question that hopefully everybody's asked and hopefully is maybe even answered. And that is, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What a great question. How do, I, how do I live forever? How do I go to heaven? What's going to happen to me when I, when I pass over to the other side, right? That's a pretty good question because life is short and troublesome. And uh, it's good to know what, what will happen after this, this life. And, uh, you know, most of us maybe have an answer for that since we were little. I mean, a lot of us, we went, we went to Sunday school. We went to vacation Bible schools. We, you know, we, we've gone to church for quite a while, and we know the answer. It's, you know, I ask Jesus into my heart and I'm going to go to heaven, right? And, you know, actually, Scripture doesn't use that terminology. That's a recent invention in the last few hundred years. Uh, but it does say if you trust in Jesus, you will, you, you will be forgiven and you will go to heaven, basically. I, I paraphrase. So, you know, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So there it is, the eternal life, everlasting life through trusting, through faith in Jesus, believing in, in the Son of God, which, which is because he died for us to, to, to reconcile us to God. It's the basic heart of the gospel. So you think when the guy said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus would say, you just ask Jesus into your heart, <laughs> or you believe in me. But he doesn't do that, which doesn't make it wrong. just means there's more to it than that. And sometimes that's a, that, that simplistic kind of thinking is as far as people go, as far as being Christians are. Oh, you know, I was in Sunday school, and I asked Jesus in my heart, which is great. John Peel tells us a story about when he did that when he was five years old. <laughs> Four? Five. <laughs> and, and it changed him. But it, 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 it ought to change us so that, you know, we, we are different kinds of people. If, if, there's no, if there's no evidence of that faith, of that presence of Christ in our lives, like we just sang in all our songs today, then it's dead. So James in his epistle says, faith without works is dead. And that's kind of where Jesus is going with this, this passage. So he says to the guy, okay, who asks him, what must I do? He says, what is written in the law? You're an expert in the law. Tell me what it says. And the guy comes back with this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting. Because... You know, this is the only place we find this coming from somebody else. Elsewhere, Jesus says the very same exact thing when asked this pretty much the same question. What is the greatest commandment, master or teacher? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This guy says the exact same thing. So Jesus says, you have answered correctly. <laughs> now, we've said this a few hundred times, but we'll say it again, just in case nobody, you weren't listening that day. So the, these two commands are from different books in, in the Bible, and uh, I think it's De 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 Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Actually, I have it right here. Yes. And uh, so one's about love and God, one's about love and neighbor. And Jesus connects them, and so does this guy. He connects them, because the two are connected. You can't go around saying, oh, I love God so much. If you don't, who, as John the Apostle says in his epistle, how can you say you love God that you can't see if you don't love your neighbor that you can see? It's ridiculous. So the two are bound together. So Jesus says, yeah, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live, presumably forever. So just go and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You got any problem with that? <laughs> no. Okay, we don't have any problem in believing that that's right. It, it's the, the activity of actually doing it that, that where we fall a little, a little bit short. We do it spottily, would you say. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, which means all the time, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
Well, this guy had the, those same reservations, and you know, the, the story could have ended here, but it says the guy wanted to justify himself. So he says to Jesus, yeah, okay, but who is my neighbor? You know, just far, how far out of my way do I have to go to love this so-called neighbor? Where do I draw the line here? Great question. So Jesus has a little story to tell. And it's a wild story, really. When you stop and think, I know you've heard it a thousand times, so forget that you've ever heard it before. <laughs> it's a wild story about violence and rescue. And that's why it's so gripping. It's, one of, it's, just, it's, you know, it's got this adventure kind of drama in it. Uh, and, and basically what happens is the guy is going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he says down, he means down. The drop from 2,300 feet above sea level in Jerusalem to 1,200 feet below sea level in Jericho. So it's, it's way down. This is like Jericho and the Dead Sea Valley are the, are the lowest kind of points on the earth that are not underwater. <laughs> so, 12, so it's about 3,500 feet down the, this long trek. Uh, to Jericho, and it's treacherous. I mean, this, these are, the road hadn't been paved yet, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, rocks and craggy corners, lots of places for thieves to hide and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't an un, this was not an unheard of kind of thing. People would go from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they would get robbed. So it says that he was set upon by a band of thieves, and they stripped his clothes off him and beat him and left him for half dead. So it's funny, you know, stripping clothes, we don't hear that so much, right? When people get, get robbed, they don't, people don't usually take their clothes. <laughs> but they took this guy's clothes. But you have to realize, in that, in that time, a lot of people would have, like, maybe only one set of, one, one, one pair, pair? <laughs> one set of clothing, or maybe two. So it was a, a, you know, a valuable commodity, a pair of clothes. A pair of clothes. <laughs> a suit. The newer new suit. A set of clothing. So the, the clothing that you would wear on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? So, so it was valuable. They, they took it. They beat him. They left him for half dead. And the, I looked this up. I thought, is that just kind of a tra loose translation of something? Actually, the word in the Greek is half dead. <laughs> so I thought, okay. So the implication is the guy, for all intents and purposes, looks like he's dead. Now, up probably the, the implication seems to be now that people come the other way. They're heading up to Jerusalem, and they see this guy on the road. He's half dead. The first two are a priest and a Levite. And that's pretty key here, because those are the religious leaders of the people. The Levites are a whole tribe of Israel. Remember the 12 tribes? The Levites are one of the tribes. And they were in charge of everything pertaining to the temple and, and uh, kind of the temple taxes and, and, and all the regulations and teaching the people about the law of Moses. Now, the, the kind of elite group within the Levites are the priests. So Moses and Aaron, for instance, were Levites, and Aaron became the first high priest. This is uh, Moses' brother Aaron. And then all his descendants after that, his sons and grandsons and all down the line, they were the priests in perpetuity. So, so they were kind of the elite, and they, they had, they had uh, authority with respect to the other Levites. And they, they, so the Levites helped the priests, who were the, the core people who, who did all the sacrifices in the temple and went into the Holy of Holies and all that kind of stuff. Big, important job in the Jewish world. The religious leaders of the Jewish people. So Jesus says, this guy, come up the road. The priest sees the, the guy, and he walks, turn, goes over to the other side of the street and walks by. Same with the Levite. And we, we think, when we hear that, we think, those good-for-nothing, <laughs> you know, hard-hearted, whatever. That's what you think. But to Jesus' first audience... The people will have said, of course they did that. <laughs> because a priest and a Levite are very, very keyed up on, on being cere ceremonially pure, especially if they're going to go up and work at the temple, because they would take tours of duty there, like a few weeks on, a few weeks off, uh, and they would have their turn there. If you touch somebody who's dead, you can't go. You know, so you've got, got to put all this effort in and of, of making your way up to Jerusalem, where you're going to serve in the temple. It's a big, important position. And if you touch a dead body, you're, you're impure for, I think it's like two weeks. Well, you go through all the motions and the cleansing and the, and the time. So they don't, they don't go near this guy. He might be dead. They would become impure. They wouldn't be able to do their job. Makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. We're not letting them off the hook that easy. So then this a third guy comes up the road. <laughs> in the Living Bible, which uh, someone read in, in Lachlan, it says, a despised Samaritan. <laughs> 
which is true, although it doesn't say that in the Scriptures. This is a Samaritan. So the Samaritans and the Jews, they're like oil and water. They just do, do not mix. They do not look at each other. They don't spend time together. I mean, some did. But especially if you were the, of the stricter persuasion, no. Uh, and you weren't supposed to because they, they were you know, kind of half-breeds and, and they didn't have things right religiously. They, they didn't believe the right stuff, all that. But the Samaritan, he comes along and he sees the guy on the road. It says, he is filled with pity. He had pity on him. That's a key verse here. He's, he's just like, oh man, look at this guy. This poor guy. And he, he can't do enough. He bends over backwards. He comes up to the guy and he binds up his wounds. It says, he pours on oil and wine. These are valuable things. You know, oil soothes wine. It's got alcohol in it. It disinfects. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to an inn. And then he says, Phew! got that off my hands. And he takes up. No, he doesn't even do that. He takes him to the inn and he stays overnight to make sure the guy's doing well. And in the morning, he pays the innkeeper extra money, a whole pile of money, two days' wages, in order to, to make sure this guy is well taken care of. And then he says, i, I got to go do something, but when I come back, I'm going to check, and if I owe you any more, I'm going to pay you that. He just goes overboard caring for this guy. And then Jesus says to the lawyer, he says, so uh, what do you think? He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? By now, the guy's captivated by the story, right? He's just drawn right in, and he says, well, the one who had mercy on him. So Jesus says, go and do likewise. <laughs> go and do likewise. So there's a lot of twists and turns in this story, and Jesus, one of the things he loves to do is, is you know, make it the opposite of what you would think. He wants to turn everything on its head. And that, that happens a lot here. So first of all, he actually turns the, turns the point of the story from who is my neighbor to, he says, that's really not the question, who is your neighbor, where do I draw the line? You know, I don't want to go, have to go too far and I don't want to deal with such and such a group. He says, that shouldn't be the question. It should be, uh, you know, who am I going to be a neighbor to? <laughs> who am I going to be a neighbor to? To someone else. So that's a, a, a kind of a totally different way of looking at it rather than, who, you know, where, where can I draw the line, where can I stop? How can I be, who can I be a neighbor to? A uh, second thing is the bad guys in the story are the law-keeping religious teachers, which is a scary thing <laughs> for all of us religious Christian types who keep the rules and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the, they're the kind of the, almost the bad guys. And they're the people that are supposed to be teaching the people how to be holy and good and, and all that sort of thing, and they fail. The good guys, this is point three, the good guy is this unenlightened stranger, foreigner, you know, who has it all wrong theologically. He doesn't believe the right stuff. And he's a guy you're not even supposed to have any dealings with. And he's a good guy. So there's a, a two or three things there that, you know, the thing just turned on its head. I think the whole story is an allegory. So, so it's really a, a little picture, the little picture story of what's going on in the world. We have a world that is beaten and broken and half dead. Because we are a, a race as a whole, the human race is a broken race. We're violent, we're you know, warmongers, we're cheaters, we're selfish, we're arrogant, we steal. You know, we, uh, you know, we, we, that's our lot. That's, you, you, I could prove that easily. Go watch the news tonight. See what's going on in the world. It's a broken world. And, and Jesus is telling us about a guy, the Good Samaritan, who stands in the place of Jesus. This is how Jesus looks at the world. He comes along and he sees somebody that's half dead, and he says, his, he has pity on him, he loves him. And then by extension, us. We are in the place of the Good Samaritan as followers of Jesus, because Jesus is building a kingdom, he's putting together a community, he's raising up a church of, of those who will stand in the place of the Good Samaritan to this broken, beaten world. Does that make sense? And, and that's, you know, we, we, we hear over and over again, we hear this criticism that, oh, well, you know, if there's a God who's good, why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he change the world? Why doesn't he help people? When the, well, <clears throat> he does. But his, his way of doing it, his main way, the way he really wants to do that is through his creatures, through us. In his wisdom, 
That's the way he's decided to do it. He's going to change the world, and he is changing the world, and he's healing the world through, through people who share his heart. I think it's an allegory. <clears throat> and the fifth point I want to make about this is it's not about duty. It's not about thing, something you've got to do. It's about compassion. This guy, the, the Samaritan in the story, he is, he's all into this thing, right? He is fully invested. He doesn't really even care about himself. He's just like, oh, man, this guy needs help. And he, he goes to all lengths to make sure the guy's back on his feet again. And it's, it's something that you can't fake. <laughs> you can't say, well, I have to do that, you know, so. <laughs> so uh, kind of go through the motions. That's not happening here. This guy, his heart is, is, is in the right place. And, and that's, I guess, part of the point here it, for us. Are we there? And I, I got to ask myself that question. Am I there? Because I know that what, what I see Jesus doing in my life is softening me and from, from a place that used to be harder. I'm on this kind of continuum, and I think we all are. If you're walking with Jesus, you used to be harder of heart and not care and thought of excuses. But you, as you move along with Jesus, you're going to find your heart is more and more compassionate, and you're more and more easily moved by this kind of stuff and the realities of the world. And, you know, I know that I'm somewhere on that road, and I know I'm not here yet. <laughs> and if I run into somebody tomorrow, how am I going to make out? That's what we've got to ask ourselves these questions. Is, is it real in us? Do we have that love? Do we have that compassion? Now, so if we have to be careful about stopping the car to, for whoever might be in trouble along the side of the road, uh, okay, but there are lots of other ways that we can uh, pitch in. So I... I, I I heard a story recently about a guy named Cameron Lyle, who was a shot putter at the University of New Hampshire, and he was top. He's like top in America in col a col at a college level. He's, he's won all kinds of medals and awards, and he was heading towards the national championships, <laughs> the Penn State, and, uh, and the shot put. But a few, uh, a couple of years earlier, and this is just something that's just happened recently, a couple of years earlier, he had signed, signed up for bone marrow transplant. So, that, so there's, a, there's, in the States at least, there's a, um, uh, what's it called, a, a record of, of, of those, a registry, thank you. There's a registry of people who are willing to donate bone marrow, and they take your bone marrow, and, and so they have your DNA on, on, uh, uh, you know, on record. And, but the chances of anybody actually needing it are like one in a million. So the guy thinks, Psh, it'll never, 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 never happen. So two weeks before he's supposed to go to his final uh, glory day shot putting, could, could get the gold for all the colleges in the United States, he gets a call. His bone marrow is needed. And if he does it, he's out of commission for months, probably. Because what they do, uh, you, you don't want to know what they do. <laughs> and in his case, they took over a liter of bone marrow out of his body. Like, they, they go into the bones and the hips. And the, well, Doug, you can tell us later. <laughs> and uh, so, so he said to himself, well, you know what? What's more important, that, that somebody lives or potentially lives, or I get some gold medal somewhere? He said, I'm doing it. And he went and told his coach, and his coach agreed 100%. He said, yeah, that is, you got it right, buddy. That's the more important thing. But it's not an easy thing. When you're all keyed up, and you've spent years and years training, and you want to do the shot. But this is a true story, by the way. And so he, 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 uh, he gave it up. And he went, went for the transplant. I think that's a little bit of a great Good Samaritan story. <laughs> this guy was all in for it. Uh, I, I heard a story this week, uh, several stories, but the, some of the people of uh, Lac Megantic in Quebec, uh, one late, well, what has happened is a whole lot of people, like 1,000 people or more, have been evacuated from the homes in the inner core of the town, the city. And uh, some of them are staying in, a, on the, in the gym floor on cots in a polyvalent, which is like a, a high school like a, or a vocational school. <coughs> and um, so one, one of the women in town, she said, you know, these elderly people living on a cot, not so good. So she went and she picked up three of the older, older people there and took them in her home and just gave them all, all their own bed and fed them and she's feeding them and she's keeping them until such time as they can go back to their own homes. You know? And we say, well, that's obvious. If we had a crisis like that in our town, we'd do that. And I hope you would. But lots of people would not. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good thing to do. Um, <clears throat> I saw a video. How are we doing here? Oh, we're good. <laughs> I saw a video where it was, it was kind of a, a setup like a, a candid camera. 
<coughs> and what they did is they had an actor uh, with a car on the edge of the street with a flat tire, and the guy needed help. And he, they had a, a, a special kind of hat on him that, that set him away as looking like he's a Muslim. <coughs> and, and he kept asking people for help, and nobody would help him. The day, the day goes on. It's a long day where people aren't helping. And this young guy comes along. He looks like he's 17 in the video. <laughs> he's probably 20 or something. And he's all full, and he says, well, what's the matter? <laughs> Reminds me of uh, Dave Wright. <laughs> he's all full of zippity-doo. And uh, he says, oh, I got a flat tire. He says, oh, okay. where's your jack? OK, open the trunk. And he's all excited. And he gets the, gets the jack out and gets the, gets the wrench out, and he's just pumping away. You can see him pumping away. And the guy, the actor, is saying to him, he says, he says you know, you, maybe you don't have time for this. If you have to do something. No, no, I got lots of time for this. <laughs> he's just pumping away. And then the producer talks to the actor and says, so ask him if he'll take some money for this. So he says, well, how much can I give you? Like, is, this has got to be worth Oh, you can't pay me for this. <laughs> Don't give me any money. <laughs> so he's pumping away. So then finally they come out with the camera. Here's our telephone ringing. <laughs> so, so they come out with the camera and they, and they explain to the young guy the story. And he's like, what? Because <laughs> he, he's just so into being a helper, help, helpful guy. So he says this. He says, what, what would you like to say about this whole thing? He says, do not judge people. By, and he's all really animated, right? You know, do not judge people by what they're wearing on their head. Everybody is the same. You trace it back far enough, we've all got the same mother and father somewhere along the line. Help out your brothers and sisters. Unconditional love for every living thing. Bah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. Thank you, brother. The way it ought to be. Um, Sir, yep. Came up this morning with an article of the uh, Minda Food Bank that spends so much time and money to help and bless five different people. Hmm. They have grown in their budget. Their budget was and totally shot for a year now, and now they've had to go into the reserve uh, okay. financially to, to continue to. You hear that? So that's the Minden Flood Bank. So let's keep that. What did I say? Let me in the food bank. Yeah. Not the flood bank. The minute food bank. Thanks, Melissa. So, so they're in their reserves now. They've used it all up because of the flood. So there, there, there's something to keep in mind when I give you your homework here. And the, the last one I was going to mention was just, I just heard this this week, a lo very local within our neighborhood here, uh, a local couple who uh, around Christmas time, they knew of people in their neighborhood who were there, one who was another couple, who was their first, uh, their first Christmas in the neighborhood, and, and some others along the street, and they just threw them a Christmas dinner, which is pretty cool. And uh, being a good neighbor, I thought. And, and the other couple were Catholics. So it's, I don't know, it's a bit like... <coughs> uh, so your homework this week. Be a neighbor. You know? Be a good Samaritan. Find a need. Maybe it's this. Pour yourself into helping somehow. And pray that you'll be ready, willing, and able. Because we need God's grace.